All right, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Stewart, I'm from the Department of Defense. And my talk today is about empowering citizen data science, which is an, actually an enterprise Jupyter use case uh, from inside the US intelligence community. So my agenda today, I'll give a quick introduction to ourselves and our organization, um, talk about why we believe Jupyter is a solution, talk about some of the focus of our work that really helps address the uh, discoverability problem of having notebooks in a large enterprise like ours, um, give, give a highlight about the results and use of Jupyter within our community, and talk about our future efforts. So the quick TLDR here is over the last three years, myself and a small team have worked to integrate Jupyter into the highly regulated, technically challenging environment of the US intelligence community. Along the way, we've developed and open source released a Jupyter notebook sharing collaboration platform called NB Gallery or Notebook Gallery. And we're doing this to empower a community within our enterprise called citizen data scientists. And these are analysts who have the aptitude, the curiosity, the creativity to explore data, but lack the traditional technical background of a developer or a data scientist. So a quick introduction to our community, the intelligence community, the IC, conducts activities that support the foreign policy and the national security of the United States. Um, and while there are many conceptions and at times misconceptions about what it is we do in the intelligence community, from the perspective of how we could benefit from using Jupiter, we're an organization with a large number of business analysts who are trying to drive insight from data. And from that perspective, I think we're very similar to a large number of organizations and uh, enterprises out there. And so what this talk is about is about empowering these business analysts to become citizen data scientists to create their own analytic capabilities, and we believe Jupiter can help with that. So who are our citizen data scientists in the community? Well, our business analysts are called intelligence analysts or intel analysts because we're in the business uh, of intelligence. They're the community that dominates our workforce, and they have very diverse backgrounds, um, uh, predominantly liberal arts type degrees, things like uh, international relations, political science. Um, and while there are exceptions, uh, generally speaking, they may not have previously had the exposure of kind of a developer programmer training or data scientist training. Uh, but we believe because they're tasked with driving insight from data, there's a huge untapped coding potential um, in this workforce because they work in the data every single day. They understand the data better than anybody else. They understand their mission better than anybody else. And we believe we can empower them to become citizen data scientists. Uh, and we think that's so important is because we operate in a very dynamic mission uh, where it, I don't think it's feasible to think that there'll be an analytic solution created at any given time that answers every question that every analyst uh, might have of their data. So as much as possible, uh, we'd like to empower them to kind of, again, create their own analytic solutions. So this is just a meme from a few years back that's kind of interesting, kind of talks about uh, how I Intel analysts believe they're perceived externally and how they kind of perceive themselves. Um, but on that top row there, you get kind of the more kind of pop culture definition of what people think it is uh, we do in the intelligence community. But that bottom row, I think, is much more relatable to any data analyst that's working in a corporate environment. Um, just to highlight again that you know, we have some of the very similar challenges that a number of other data-driven organizations have. And our approaches to solving them may be applicable. And again, the approaches that I hear all today have been very applicable to our use case. So why is Jupyter a solution for us? Or why do we believe it's a, a solution for us? Well, hopefully I'm in a friendly audience here about kind of uh, why Jupyter is important, at least friendly from the perspective of Jupyter. A um, couple of things that I highlight kind of internally about why I think this is so uh, helpful for us. Number one, being web-based, this is far more approachable for these citizen data scientists that traditionally most likely have not been exposed to kind of command line development environment. So we heard you know, on the education panel about just those first hurdles of getting up and running, you know, take away from what you're actually trying to teach them, what you're trying to get them to do. So offering them a web-based environment via Jupyter is really powerful to get them up and running as fast as possible. Uh, the notebook format, allowing the analysts to document their tradecraft alongside their code into a portable document that they can share across the community is incredibly valuable. Um, supporting the wide variety of languages that are in use internally is great um, because while our data is unique and certainly our means of acquiring that data uh, can be very unique, the type of analysis we want to do in that data generally is not. And so where there are external solutions that exist in a wide variety of languages, allowing our analysts to, to benefit from those immediately is, is, is very valuable. Um, so in practice, that means obviously Python is one of the big languages in use. Um, we do have a lot of uh, users writing notebooks in Ruby and R, as well as Octave, kind of tying into Ryan's talk uh, from two slides ago, as well as a variety of other, other, of other languages. But to get Jupyter used in an enterprise environment, we must address a series of challenges that aren't unique to us in our enterprise. So Paco said this better than I could in his blog post uh, a week ago about announcing the JupyterCon. Uh, but challenges around collaboration, around security, around compliance, uh, again, every enterprise will have these challenges. We certainly do ourselves. And so it's how do we address these in order to get Jupyter used at scale. In our particular instance, as you might imagine, uh, data sensitivity challenges can be pretty extreme. 
Uh, we're not alone in having data sensitivity challenges, so the healthcare field with HIPAA will have some very similar restrictions. Uh, but again, in our case, it can be uh, pretty extreme. And it kind of manifests itself in two ways. Uh, number one, we have very strict uh, corporate data security and compliance policies that need to be adhered to when we're talking about processing uh, some of our corporate data using a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and secondly, the input data of that notebook can be very dynamic and can actually vary by time and by user. And this happens because of the, of the dynamic mission uh, space that we operate in, as well as this kind of need to know principle, which it, uh, results in extremely fine grained security of our data. And just quickly what that means is, uh, the need to know principle is, is just having a top secret clearance doesn't mean that you get access to the, our corporate data. Um, access to data is limited strictly by a demonstrated mission need to know. Uh, and in practice, if this was a, a, you know, a, a community of, of people I was presenting to, you could pick two people and odds are they don't have the same level of access, they don't have the same level of data. So uh, that needs to be, uh, we need to make sure we kind of adhere to both of these policies as we talk about using Jupyter at scale uh, within our community. And so how we do that from the kind of an uh, executing environment of a Jupyter notebook is we use ephemeral personalized virtual machines where the ephemeral or short-term nature helps us address the corporate security and data compliance policies, and that personalized nature helps us ensure that need to know principle, because only the single user that's authorized to see that data can get access to that environment uh, to run that notebook. And so we describe this as a micro data science environment, which is perfect for the individual. We can give the analyst an environment from which they can process the mission data that they're uniquely accessed and authorized to, to get access to, uh, that it addresses our corporate data security and our compliance policies, uh, but the downside of this is it overlooks the community. We'll have dozens or hundreds of unique users on independent kind of islands of data science that by design are not configured to collaborate and to uh, communicate with each other. So to overcome that, we've developed uh, NB Gallery or Notebook Gallery as a Jupyter Notebook sharing collaboration platform. We note it's for code only. Uh, we don't allow the sharing of notebooks that have output because of that sensitivities that need to know principle. We can't guarantee that if a given user ran a notebook and has data in it, that other users can see that same notebook with that data in it. So we're only allowing users to share code. Uh, we looked into to existing capabilities when we started developing this. Uh, you know, if you think about sharing code within an enterprise, thing like something like a enterprise instance of GitHub or GitLab might be the most natural thing to think of, but as that kind of cartoon depicts there, um, we, we felt that Git was kind of putting it further out of the reach of our citizen data scientists that most likely would not have had previous experience um, at the command line, and so something like Git, while being very powerful, again, as that comic depicts, can be confusing, uh, and so we didn't want to require users to have to know command line Git in order to contribute to, author, or share um, Jupyter Notebooks. So NB Gallery for us is this great enterprise notebook sharing collaboration platform that provides a really single, easy to use web-based interface to, to find notebooks and contribute to them. Uh, so just showing you here, this is what NB Gallery looks like. This is the home screen. Uh, we can go in and kind of search and discover notebooks. Uh, when you find one, you see a rendering of that notebook as well as some metadata um, that describes how that notebook is, has been used within our enterprise. But next, we need to kind of tie together these decoupled environments. So the NB Gallery only allows the sharing of the notebook and the code, whereas these personal ephemeral compute environments allow for the execution uh, of that notebook. And so writing a Jupyter extension, we created the ability to have a, a little menu here that allows you to upload a notebook easy to the gallery, submit a change request to an existing notebook. Um, and then when that notebook gets sent up, it's automatically stripped of its input and output data to ensure that that data remains in that environment um, that's authorized to actually process that data. And then in the gallery here, again, as a web-based rendering of the notebook, you click one in Jupyter, it launches it into your personal um, compute environment uh, to execute that notebook. All right, now I'll talk about our, our, our uh, emphasis on recommenders and health and really how this helps ad us address the discoverability problem at scale. Because uh, this is a challenge of navigating this collaborative environment. If we crowdsource analytic solution across a large enterprise, we're going to end up with some side effects of an increased volume of solutions that we need the analysts to be able to kind of navigate through and discover ones that are relevant to them, as well as some just natural redundancy where um, through no fault of their own, analysts are across a large enterprise or working on similar solutions unaware of each other and may contribute things that are, that are redundant. And so we're addressing this in two ways. Uh, number one, we're putting emphasis on recommenders uh, to help analysts discover notebooks that are relevant to them specifically. Uh, and number two, we have a big emphasis on trying to automatically measure the health of notebooks so we can provide insight to the analyst of whether that notebook, the expectation that notebook works um, in the current environment. 
On the recommender side, right, this is not unique to us, all right, this is somewhat a solved problem with many other uh, platforms that are helping to recommend products or services to user. Um, we're doing that specifically with Jupyter Notebooks in this case. And we have kind of three varieties of recommender analytics that we run uh, across our corpus of notebooks. Uh, the first is looking at notebook usage, things like trendiness and health. I'll go into more detail on health in the next few slides. Um, we also look at things like non-personalized recommendations, so content similarity of notebooks, and that kind of traditional user also viewed uh, recommendation of notebooks. And then finally, we look at personalized recommendations, where across our enterprise, we try to identify similar users uh, to that active user and recommend notebooks that the other users have used. Um, in some cases, we have organizational information, which we can use to recommend notebooks that we know are relevant uh, based on a hierarchical organizational structure to people within that same organization. Uh, we can hard code, and we do hard code notebooks that we think are relevant to new users. Uh, so if we know they're new to the platform, we can try to get them up and running as quickly as possible with notebooks that are, that are kind of the introduction to Jupyter and introduction to NB Gallery type notebooks, as well as looking over the corpus of notebooks that that one particular user has viewed the most and then looking at content similarity of those notebooks to again recommend notebooks that we think might be relevant to them. Uh, we have a, a much more detailed white paper describing all those analytics. If you want to see it, it's on our github.io site, which is nbgallery.github.io if you want to read more details about that. Uh, but how that presents itself to the user is you come to the NB Gallery homepage, we have a list of recommended notebooks on the homepage, which are kind of aggregation of those seven different recommender analytics that we run. So in this case here, you can see we're recommending this notebook because it's been used by uh, other users within the organization, as well as it's similar to other uh, notebooks that this particular user has liked. And then when you view a given notebook in the gallery, uh, we provide two kind of scrolling bars of recommended notebooks one of which is that content similarity of similar notebooks based on content, and one of which is kind of the user also viewed, typical view that you might see. In this case here, it's kind of interesting to note, this is a Summer of Python notebook, a 12-week uh, series of notebooks we ran um, to try to teach introductory Python to these citizen data scientists, these business analysts. And if you look closely at the recommended bars, I don't know if you can see it, but this is week two we're viewing, and all the recommended notebooks, either based on content or user also viewed, are the other weeks. Um, of that summer of Python, so out of thousands of notebooks, right, it did a, a pretty good job of recommending notebooks that we thought might be interesting. So how effective is this? Um, so this is a, a chart here that's showing the percentage of notebooks viewed uh, within our instance of NB Gallery based on uh, the bottom bar is recommendations, and so we're seeing about 15% of notebooks viewed uh, are based on recommendations, which is a great way to kind of introduce uh, potentially new citizen data scientists into the platform because hopefully we're putting notebooks in front of them that are of interest to them or relevant to their mission. Uh, and that top bar there represents notebooks that are viewed based on search terms. So kind of the more advanced user that knows what they're looking for um, goes into the gallery and, and tries to identify notebooks of that. And that's generally around 30% of notebook views. On the health side, we define notebook health as the expectation that a notebook works in the current environment. And this is so important for our users because a user who discovers a broken notebook will first think that it was something that they did wrong, especially if they're one of these citizen data scientists that don't have a strong technical background, and they'll lose confidence in either themselves or the platform, and neither of which is an outcome that we want. Um, and, and again, because they may not have a lot of technical experience and may not have done a lot of development in data science work themselves, uh, the ability for them to debug the notebook is something that we, we don't want them to have to know how to do that, to understand that it wasn't them, it wasn't the platform, there was just something wrong in that environment. And so we actually calculate health metrics, I'll go into a little more detail about in a second here, and we use that to boost both the search results and the recommendations to ensure that as much as possible, we're presenting notebooks in front of users that we believe can work uh, within the current environment. And so why is that important for us and why is it a challenge for us? Well, uh, talking about the, what, what do we value from a, a healthy notebook? First and foremost, a notebook is only healthy if the individual code cells that make up that notebook is healthy. And so how we determine that is from those, you know, again, sandboxed, uh, personalized ephemeral compute environments, we record the execution status of every cell of every notebook and report that back to the central location of MB Gallery. Uh, because the sensitivity of the input data that each of those cells could have processed, uh, the only granularity we can get is was that cell executed and did it succeed? And we define exceed uh, kind of rather bluntly as just saying, did it throw an exception? Um, and so we record that status back to NB Gallery. The next thing we look to see is how far the user made it through the notebook. Because uh, generally speaking, the further a user is executing a Jupyter notebook, the more likely it is that they believe it's working. Um, otherwise, they probably would have ab abandoned it before then. 
Uh, third, we look at how many unique users have run, have run that notebook. And just as a, as a quick step back, um, the traditional approach here would be just test the notebook with you know, a sample set of data. The problem is we don't, ha we don't know, we don't have access to all possible data sets that the user might bring into that notebook because of that fine-grained security and that need-to-know principle. So we have to just observe passively the execution of these notebooks and try to determine and infer whether or not we think they're healthy. Um, so in this case here, the, the number of unique users have run that notebook adds confidence that it's healthy because while a single user may have run it and it may have worked for them, um, a second, a third, or fourth user may have different access to the data, may bring different types of data into that notebook. And so the more people we observe running a notebook, the more confident we are that that's actually a healthy notebook in this environment. And lastly, we'll look at how recently that notebook was executed. Um, like any enterprise, we kind of operate in a dynamic enterprise IT environment with dynamic APIs. Uh, and so just practically speaking, uh, the, the longer it's been since we've seen a notebook executed, the less confident we are that it's healthy because something could have changed in our environment, something could have changed with the APIs that it was trying to call um, to pull data in. And so uh, what we do is over a 30-day period, uh, we degrade the health of a notebook if we don't hear any other additional information about how that notebook's been executed, and then at the end of the 30 days, it's automatically marked as unknown until we get new information in the system that can lead us to believe otherwise one way or the other. Uh, this is another example where we have a much more detailed white paper that we published on our GitHub site, uh, if you want to go and read much more details about it. But how this presents itself to the user is when viewing a notebook, we have a little icon there at the top that will be green if we believe that notebook's healthy, it'll be red if we believe that notebook's unhealthy, and it'll be gray if we th believe it's unknown. Uh, you can mouse over it, get some high-level detail there saying, you know, 28 people have run this notebook in the last 30 days, therefore we're, you can be confident that we think it works. If you click that, you actually get a, this graph here, which is a cell-by-cell -cell breakdown of the executions of that notebook, where each of these bars represents an individual cell, and blue is representing a successful execution of that cell, and a red is representing a failed execution of that cell. And this is a good one to highlight because get, it just gets into some of these real world kind of enterprise challenges we have of trying to determine uh, notebook health. Because what you're seeing here is in general, there is about 20 or more executions that go from the start to the finish of the notebook with some exceptions. So at the start here, you're noticing a few users have had failed executions of that first cell. That's likely a reflection of that dynamic enterprise IT environment that we're running in, where a given user at a given location at a given time was unsuccessful in trying to load in external dependencies or try to load in external data that that notebook needed. Therefore, the cells failed. But generally speaking, most users were able to succeed and get through uh, the rest of the cells. We're also noticing instances here where it looks like no one ran a given cell or a very few number of people ran a given cell. Um, and because this is one of these Summer of Python notebooks, these, these teaching training notebooks that we have, um, these cells actually have an exercise in them where we want the user to edit the cell um, to in order to complete that exercise. And when they edit the cell, uh, we don't know what they're doing to either fix or break the cell. And so we don't want um, to record the execution status of that and count it against the original author. Um, so we automatically disregard any cells that have been executed uh, that have changed the contents of the cell from the original um, version of it. So we're seeing here a little exercise. This is kind of intro to pandas type um, notebook here where we're asking someone to apply this method as a variable. A few people ran it <laughs> without realizing it was an exercise. So you see kind of recorded executions there. Oops, sorry. Uh, but most people most likely um, edited that, that cell before they ran it, which is why you're not seeing it recorded there. And so to account for the kind of wide variety of notebooks that we see um, and to do this in a way that, that we think is helpful, uh, we calculate almost a dozen different unique health metrics that we aggregate together into an overall health score um, that's assigned at the top level of that notebook and again is reflected in its search and recommendations um, results. That's all detailed, again, on that white paper on nbgallery.github.io if you want to go read that later. All right, so I'll give you a quick update on the results and use of our notebooks. Um, within our enterprise, we have thousands of notebooks that are written by hundreds of unique authors. Uh, these notebooks have been used by thousands of unique users. Uh, it's actually a six to one ratio of users to authors. And that happens because we need these users to run these notebooks themselves because of that fine-grained security. We can't have someone just run the notebook and give the results to other users. We need, notebook, we need sorry, users to run these themselves. And so this is actually a great way to introduce future citizen data scientists into the platform because they can run a notebook and they can start making connections of, oh, that little bit of code took the data that I knew about because I previously worked with that data and turned it into something else. And they start kind of learning by practicing and by doing, um, by, by actually running these notebooks. 
And just down below here, I just give a quick um, you know, graph that talk about the rate of change of Jupyter adoption over the last two years within our community. So this one here is looking at the total number of notebooks that are being submitted to NB Gallery. And this here is the total number of users that are, uh, sorry, total num unique number of users uh, that are running notebooks per week over the last two years. Both show, I think, pretty good you know, rates of change and rates of growth. You know, the natural exception that around the holidays, right, and the number of users kind of slow down and it's, it's picked back up since then. And this growth happens because we're really seeing some grassroots-led enterprise-wide user buy-in. And one of the ways we're getting that within our enterprise is we're providing metrics to the user that helps build confidence in their contributions to the systems, contributions, sorry, to the platform, um, and, get, and gives them value about, about being an active contributor. So in this case here, one of the metrics that we show, any user can view this for themselves or any other user, is looking at the number of users of, no, uh, sorry, the number of unique users of notebooks that they wrote. Um, and this is really helpful come like performance review season uh, where they go to the managers and they can actually put, and that's why we have the start stop time there because we put, we allow them to say during this performance review period, X number of people have benefited from notebooks that I've written across, you know, Y number of organizations. Um, and so that quote down below was from actually the blog post when we announced we released this. Um, and again, it, it seems like a little thing on its face, but it really, it's really helpful within this enterprise environment uh, for users to get bought in to being an active contributor and be an active supporter um, of these notebooks. The other exciting thing that's happening right now is we're seeing kind of uh, uh, these Intel analysts, these citizen data scientists um, be strong advocates within their peer groups. So these two quotes I just pulled out in the last two weeks from blog posts internally um, while I was making these slides. And in both cases, these are kind of written by analysts for other analysts um, to get involved and get interested in the platform. And the theme that they're trying to underline uh, is they're both talking about being empowered to create their own analytic solutions with Jupyter um, and advocating for other analysts, you know, if, if with all the tools we have, all the capabilities that we have, if you can't answer your questions, Jupyter may be able to help. And so we're, we're seeing this kind of organic level growth um, throughout our enterprise, which is great to see. So lastly, talk about the type of use cases we have for notebooks. Generally speaking, we've been them into three categories. We have our operational notebooks, our course material notebooks, and our building block notebooks. Because of the sensitivities of some of the data involved, I can't really show you an example of one of our operational notebooks. Um, but the kind of common themes for these notebooks is that they use data from our corporate repositories, that fine-grained security data I talked about before, and they support a particular business or mission function um, that's helping that analyst, again, drive insights uh, from their data. Uh, the second use case here, we actually teach you know, our enterprise you know, intro to coding courses using Jupyter Notebooks. We've heard a lot about Jupyter in education today. Um, the notebook format obviously lends itself greatly uh, to this use case. Uh, but the other huge benefit we get from an enterprise is we can teach people how to code in the exact same platform they can use that code for operational purposes. Because one of the huge hurdles we've always had to deal with is users who go out and benefit from some of the many amazing you know, intro to Python courses, intro to Ruby courses, or R courses, et cetera, that exist externally. And then they come inside and say, how do I actually use this in ways that are compliant, in ways that you know, allow me to access the data I want to access. And so by teaching, this is from our intro to Python course, uh, by teaching it through this exact same platform they can use it operationally, it really reduces the barriers from going from the learned to the applied. And then lastly, we have this use case, kind of a catch-all for other notebooks that we call building blocks. And these are notebooks that aren't necessarily part of a formal training course. Uh, and in most cases, these notebooks never touch any of our corporate kind of business data. They're simple examples of sharing reproducible code snippets in a notebook format so that others in the community can benefit from it. And they kind of span a range from, you know, really being things of interest, like this example of Einstein summation using a Python library, to things that could be a little more fun and whimsical, like this ASCII art generator notebook, but just a demonstration of you doing something in, in Python and sharing it with the community. And as an aside here, that ASCII art notebook is actually the notebook that I use in all of my Intro to Jupyter workshops because uh, it's generally applicable to everyone. You don't have, you have required any special access to run that notebook. And it provides kind of instant gratification that you pressed play on some code and it did something that you can actually see in the output. So it really helps you know, new users and new system data scientists um, understand that this thing that you're looking at, this web page, is actually executing code and doing something, and now you can see the result of that, as well as get some awesome ASCII art you can copy and paste in other use cases. Um, so what is the breakdown of notebooks? So as, as data science nerds, we did some data science on data science uh, to try to figure it out, and so we actually wrote a machine learning model that tries to classify notebooks into these three categories, ran it across our corpus of data, and what we're seeing here is that you know, about half of the notebooks are in this operational use case, 
and the other half are kind of broken down in the use cases that support the operational use case, either formal training or informal building blocks. And as an aside, one of the features of this model uh, that I thought was most valuable is looking at the ratio of number of times executed by number of users that ran it. Because generally, given the dynamic nature of our data, an operational notebook will be run over and over again by the same user, whereas a course material notebook or a building block notebook usually only gets run once or twice by that user while they're trying to learn that feature. All right, so lastly, i got less than five minutes here uh, on a future effort. Um, one of the, these are the three things we're actually working on right now. Uh, one is to, try, is to try to tie in Jupyter to our corporate GUIs uh, to increase that six to one ratio I talked about previously. Uh, we believe uh, we have you know, uh, corporate GUIs that we use internally uh, that we believe if we can tie a Jupyter notebook into it, we can increase that to a much larger ratio of, of people who can benefit from Jupyter notebooks versus those who are just authoring Jupyter notebooks. Uh, second thing there, we're trying to figure out how to scale a peer-based code review system that can scale with the, our users and our platform. And we're treating it as a recommender problem. So given a notebook that has potentially reached a certain threshold of use or is self-nominated by the author, what other authors within our large community uh, would be best suited to uh, review that notebook? And so we look at things like similar use of language, similar use of libraries, potentially similar use of um, users, so we know they're in a similar organization, as well as a thing that we're currently calculating right now called the author contribution score, which is a percentile from zero to 100, um, to show what benefit, what impact we think that user's having within our community. And then lastly, we're just trying to expand our citizen data science community. I mentioned Summer Python a number of times. Uh, and what we're finding that value is, the first thing these Intel analysts, these business analysts want to know is how do I do what I'm doing right now and then teach me how to do more kind of data science stuff. So we're, we're focusing on kind of intro to Python-based data analysis and the introductions of how to actually get their corporate data um, using Python. And then we follow on that later with actually how to do data science type applications. So I hope that was an interesting look about how the IC is using Jupyter. I think I'm almost out of time, but I'm happy to take questions if there are any.